Volair does electronic design. We design wearable devices and IoT devices. And I'm going to talk about wearable devices. So first thing I'll talk about is some of the physiological measurements, which is a real important part of wearable devices. That's mostly what they do. And then battery limitations, which are major drivers of how you design them, how you can deal with the limited power, and then a few important things like data security and getting through the FDA. So right now, wearable devices are really hot. There, there's the old stuff like the Fitbit, but Fitbit is not hot. But there's a lot of other things coming along. Uh, what's driving this is people need data. There are data companies that come to us and say, we don't really want to build a piece of hardware, but we need data, so we're going to have to do it. The other thing that's driving it is hospitals want to keep you at home. If you go back for the same condition within 30 days, they don't get paid. Uh, but they also don't want you to get sick staying at home. So what do they do? They monitor you at home. So I'm going to talk about these eight parameters that you can measure on the body and how that's done and some of the limitations. Body temperature seems very straightforward. Thermometers, old-fashioned. Uh, it's difficult because what you really want to measure in most cases is the core temperature. And what you're measuring is the skin temperature. And the skin temperature, for example, on the wrist may be very different from the core temperature if you're in a cold room, for example, or outdoors when it's cold. There are ways to improve that measurement by making other measurements. For example, if you know that the air temperature is cold, it's not a good time to, to use the value that you're measuring on the wrist. If the temperature is moderate, it's a better time. But if the skin is wet because somebody's been exercising, that's not a good time either. And then the skin could be wet for other reasons, but if you've got an accelerometer and you detected there was a lot of rapid motion, then you know that somebody was exercising or moving rapidly. So by fusing a lot of different sensors, sensor fusion, you can turn a measurement that's not very good into a measurement that's much more accurate. Another important thing about measuring temperature is the contact. You're measuring actually heat flow. It's flowing from inside the body to out of the body. And if that sensor doesn't make good contact, then you're not going to act actually measure the temperature you wanted. And for example, on a wrist, I wear my wrist wristwatch rather loose. It may not make good contact. So how people actually use the device becomes very important. Motion, I already talked about a little. Um, it's been very popular for a long time for step counts, but it measures a lot of other things. There are algorithms provided by the manufacturers of motion chips. For example, you can measure gait, and gait is an indication of various types of illness. You can actually determine if somebody is standing, sitting, walking, and you can do this with a device on the wrist or a device that's on the ankle. Uh, different algorithms, whether it's on the wrist or the ankle, but these algorithms already exist. Dead reckoning is very helpful when you want to know where somebody is and where they're going, uh, which direction they're going. The motion sensor chips can do that. They have uh, nine axes of, of motion detection now in a single chip. Uh, they're good for short term. Over time, they get, lose accuracy. So if you need to know where somebody is for hours or days, then you need GPS. But GPS is power hungry. So and these chips are very low power. Heart rate, very important measurement in the body. You can measure it with ECG electrodes. Now, you don't need a complete ECG, just two electrodes, even on the wrist, that works fine. Uh, electrodes, what people really want is a dry electrode, and dry electrodes need to make good contact. So another way that people do it is with the pulse oximeter technology, a PPG. The pulse oximeter is used for measuring oxygen, but the, the main thing it measures, actually, is the pulse. And they remove the pulse in order to see the oxygen. So uh, pulse oximetry works very well as a transmitted type. I'll talk about this more in the next slide. The reflective type works everywhere on the body, but it doesn't work as well. And if you want to put a wearable device on the finger or the ear, not too many wearable devices fit in that category. Another way you can measure pulse is with pressure. If you put your finger on your wrist, you can actually measure the pulse. And you could do that with a sensor. This doesn't work as well as that's not commonly done. So on blood oxygen, the technology is rather old now. You use uh, two infrared uh, light sources, and you look at the light that's passed through the body. One of them is sensitive to the pulse, and the, and the other one is sensitive to the oxygen. And you can remove the effect of the, the pulse. Uh, and what you're left with is the oxygen. The transmissive type is what's been in use for a long time. The light passes through the body. It has to pass through the finger 
or the ear, uh, any other part of the body is too thick to get enough light through. Most places where you want to use it are thicker than that. So there are many people that are providing, many companies providing the reflective type. The amount of light that's reflected is much smaller than what gets transmitted. So the sensitivity and the accuracy is much less. So if you're using the reflective type, you can make these measurements, you can make oxygen measurements. Getting them accurate enough to meet FDA requirements is tricky. In fact, you, we did a test where we did put one to simply measure pulse. Pulse is easier to measure than oxygen. And we decided that for a demonstration at a sh trade show, it didn't work well enough. It, most of the time, it didn't work. It, you really got to work at it to make these work. Now, ECG uh, for the heart, EMG for muscles, EEG for the brain, they're all measuring electrical signals. Seems very straightforward. Uh, but again, you need electrodes, and people would like dry electrodes. You know, getting a wet electrode and applying it with a wearable device is inconvenient. Um, <laughs> For ECG, it's important to have separation. On the chest, I'm saying one and a half inches works. That's small. Uh, if you look, take a look at the Apple Watch, they're measuring ECG on the wrist. But what they may not have told you, you may not have noticed, you have to reach over with the other hand and touch the watch. So they're actually getting from one hand to the other, far apart. It doesn't measure ECG continuously. So there's a limitation. Uh, the standard is 12 leads for an ECG. That's what you get in the laboratory if you go to the doctor. Uh, there are companies now that claim they're getting as good a results for detecting disease with just two leads. But this would be typically on the chest or you reach over and you touch so you're actually getting from arm to arm. EMG is measuring the same sort of thing but on muscles. A very common place to measure it would be on the forearm. You can detect individual muscles on the forearm and detect which finger is moving from an EMG signal. Now, there's a limitation. You don't have a good reference on the arm, and if you're off by a few millimeters, you're on the wrong muscle, and you're detecting the wrong finger. So uh, how do you position something on the wrist that's accurate within one or two millimeters? Uh, you could put a, an ink dot there, but that's going to wear away. So that can be a problem. In EEG, if you're measuring the brain, the only place you can do it is on the head. It could be on the forehead, the temples. There are helmets that do these measurements. Um, it would be nice if you could do it not on the head because something you're going to wear a long time, maybe a hat's okay, but not typically indoors. Respiration is another very important parameter, and the standard is to put on a chest strap. And there are devices that do this. It's, that's easy to measure. But a chest strap is inconvenient for a wearable device. Another way of making the, movement, making the measurement is with thoracic impedance. You're actually measuring the impedance of the chest. As, it, as you breathe in and out, that impedance changes. And it can be quite readily picked up. Uh, but this needs to be on the chest. So what people would like to do is put it on the wrist. I know people have tried it. I haven't seen it actually work because the wrist has this big impedance called your arm between it and your chest. And that impedance is much larger. So you've suddenly made that signal much smaller. And that's very difficult. Blood pressure is right now the only way to get accurate blood pressure is with a cuff. Um, you know, cuff on your arm. Now, it says here it doesn't work on the wrist. It, there are devices that work on the wrist. The accuracy and the difficulty of getting it is questionable. Um, what people really want to do is measure it anywhere on the body other than a, a cuff. Cuff, definitely not convenient. And pulse transit time is the way that people are doing it today. Pulse transit time compares the time when the, pulse, when the heart beats to when that pulse reaches an extremity. You can do that very well on the wrist. With two electrodes, you pick up the ECG signal, the heart, the heart beating signal, the electrical signal. That comes instantly when the heart beats. And then milliseconds later, you get the pulse. You can measure it with the, the pulse plethysmograph, the PPG signal. So you can see that time difference. And the, the, rate, the way that it changes from uh, the difference in time changes. That is changing due to the, uh, your blood pressure. The difficulty is to get it accurate enough. There are people that claim they've gotten enough accuracy to meet FDA requirements for diagnosis, but I haven't actually seen it. So you can do it where you've getting an indication that your blood pressure has gone up. Uh, it works fine for that. 
you can also calibrate it. I can take my blood pressure and enter something in my device. It will give me an accurate measurement from then on. Um, but to, to give a, if I give you a device and I give it to anybody, it's not going to work accurately enough, at least not right now, but people are working on it. Glucose measurement, uh, another very common one. Today we have devices that you can wear as a patch. And they have microneedles. Now, they don't feel like needles. They just go through the skin, so they're not uncomfortable. But they're actually getting through the skin enough to pick up a glucose signal. Um, so you have wearable patches measuring glucose. They do require calibration. You've got to prick your finger once or twice a day because they're not accurate over a long period of time. Also, you need a very good perfusion of blood where you're measuring the glucose and the wrist is not a good place. So you can, you can see from this that the most common place where people would like to have a wearable device on the wrist is probably the worst place to put it. Today, we've got the, the sensors and we have pumps that pump glucose, or actually they, they control the glucose with uh, insulin. And that means you can have a wearable pancreas for people that have even type 1 diabetes. So there's been a lot of progress there. Let's talk, talk about battery limitations. Batteries have been progressing, but slowly. If batteries had progressed like semiconductors over the last 50 years, you would have a battery the size of the head of a pin. It would cost a penny and it would drive your car. And we're not even remotely close and we never will be. We're limited by chemical storage of energy. And right now, batteries are about 10% of the ultimate. And the ultimate is something like gasoline. Gasoline has a bit of a problem with safety. I don't want to pour gasoline in my pocket. The other one that's more efficient is nuclear energy. I don't want to have that in my pocket either. So we're limited for batteries for the, for the foreseeable future. They'll get a little better. So. Every time we design a wearable device or any battery-operated device, people say, I, I want it to operate for a year. I want it to send lots of power, and I want it to work all the time. And, of course, now you have to make trade-offs. Let's talk about uh, the impact of, of the limited power. The way that people would like to send data from a wearable device is directly to the cloud, just like a cell phone. Cell phone, uh, take a look at the battery of a cell phone and how long it lasts, and you already have an idea that this isn't practical for a lot of applications. So another way to do it is have a sensor send the data uh, to a gateway. Well, Wi-Fi works like this. Uh, that's a good way, but most wearable devices are in the third category where they use something like Bluetooth, they send it to your cell phone. If you're not wearing your cell phone, then it's not able to send to the cloud, so it has to wait until you have your cell phone nearby. That's very efficient. Now, there's technology that's out, not quite widely enough available, but you're going to be seeing it, where you can send low-speed data long distances, so you'll have wearable devices sending data directly to the cloud at the same energy level as Bluetooth, or Bluetooth LE even. So how much power do sensors use? Well, if you take a look at the first two here, a camera uses a lot of power. 300 milliwatts is the power that's going to drain your cell phone in hours. And cell phones have a pretty big battery compared to a wearable device. The illumination, if you're not in daytime, would almost double that. So these are not, this, uh, there are, uh, the police do wear cameras, but those aren't going to last very long. They last for a short time. GPS, I mentioned, is moderately power hungry, so you don't want to run it all the time. A load cell, which can we measure weight or force, moderate. Pulse oximeters are getting a little lower, but they're, they're moderate. But you don't have to run them all the time. How often do you have to know what your, your oxygen level is? Maybe once an hour. EKG and heart rate, now we're getting to quite a low power. One milliwatt, we're 300 times lower than the camera. The nine-axis motion, nine motion sensor, also very low. Microphones can be extremely low or moderate. Light intensity, uh, also extremely low to moderate. But the, the winner in this is the three-axis accelerometer, which is what Fitbit had to begin with. You can get far less than a milliwatt. It's just a few microwatts. And what people do now do is they leave the accelerometer running all the time and shut everything else down. And if you move, it wakes up the processor, which takes more power than the accelerometer, 
And the processor quickly looks to see if something, if that movement was something important, and if it wasn't, it goes back to sleep. This is an important way to save power. Doing things like that, you can have a battery last for a year, and yet do many of these other measurements that only happen now and then. Let's talk about data security. Data security is a really big deal in wearable devices. And the FDA has weighed in on this in 2016. It's been a while. And the surprising thing is people aren't terribly worried about it. I, I would expect more of our customers would be worried than, than they are. The FDA requires end-to-end -end security. It doesn't require. It's, it's only guidance. But as you know, guidance is not something to be ignored. Uh, so if you've got a device that somebody's wearing, you don't have control over it. They're, they're all over the place. How do you know that the device that's being used is the right device? Is it, is it authorized to send data? Is that device on the right person? Has it been spoofed? Is, is there a different device sending data? Or is a, one of your own de devices on the wrong person? Uh, is it sending the right data? Is it sending it accurately? Is it the right time? And then the data gets to the cloud, and you have to store it accurately and safely in the cloud. Uh, it's very easy to have problems, particularly with these devices that are not under control of a medical professional. And then a real Achilles heel, many of these devices can have the software updated over the air. Well, if, you're, if that device is unable to detect where that update is coming from, I can update that device myself. I can put new software in it. Now it'll do whatever I want it to do. That's a serious breach of security. And most devices today don't do such a good job on these things. Fortunately, there are companies that offer software and hardware that help you solve the security problems. So you don't have to do it all from scratch. Um, Secure RF has an encryption that runs on a tiny processor. Um, Intrinsic ID and other companies use uh, the, the key that's in the device comes from the state that the device comes up. So it's, there's some randomness when RAM turns on. And that's used to generate a key. So you don't have to put the key in the device. It already has it. And every device has a different key. And then there's companies like Secure Push that will provide you hardware and software and, and everything to the cloud. So it's, it's not as daunting as it could be, but it's still, I find our customers aren't really asking for it. And even when we tell them, it's not a high priority. Now let's talk about FDA clearance. Uh, there's an interesting thing that the FDA has done for, where, for devices that are apps. So if you put it on a smartphone, for example, if you're helping people self-manage their disease without providing a spe specific treatment, without diagnosing, that's not a medical device. If you're helping patients send data to their medical professional, uh, as long as it's not diagnosing, that's not a medical device. If you're helping patients get their data from their health records, that's not a medical device. And automating tasks, now what, it, what simple is is undefined, but automating tasks for healthcare workers, not a medical device. However, many of these, if you create a wearable device that's not a phone, and that, and it does the same thing, it would be a medical device. There's, a, there's definitely a gray area here. But, so they, they gave leeway to apps, but probably not to a wearable device. So it's very easy to end up making a medical device when you don't realize you're making a medical device. We help our customers with that all the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you.